Well, it looks like most of you decided not to drop class, so welcome back to week two. Let's take a look. Let's get into our pattern here. Looking at week two, I think I know some of you have already looked at it. Um, but let's see. Oh, for some reason, the week two went all the way to the bottom. Let's change that. Uh, two little things to watch in your, I don't want to call it spare time, but in your class time that's not with me. Um, let's see. One, I'm not going to watch them with you today. Anyone know, because we're kind of talking about the, the theme of the, when you're not here, is kind of becoming an adult, right? When do you become an adult? Kind of revisiting that question that you filled out on the first day. And two things that are related. One video is appropriately called, when do you become an adult? We're kind of and then talk about a couple concepts with that in the lecture today. Um, so that one's important. It kind of, that one kind of explores all the different ways uh, that we try to define adulthood. Not just in our society, but also in other societies. So, from a biological perspective, psychological perspective, social perspective, what the heck even is an adult? And I think you'll realize quickly the way we define it, it seems a little bit arbitrary sometimes, the way we define the word adult and what that means. I mean, all of us probably have a relative that's much older than us that doesn't act like an adult. But then, what does it even mean to act like an adult? What's an adult supposed to act like? You know, are there certain ways you can't act anymore just because you're 35? I don't know. Anyway, that's kind of what that's about. The other one is, well, I think it resonates. Uh, we'll actually probably revisit this concept later on in the course, but some of you probably know what this is. Some of you may have never heard of this before, um, but this is you guys. It's not me, thankfully, so some things separate us generationally, and this is one of them. You guys are part, you didn't know, but you're part of this thing. I love it when we give people labels. And in psychology, we love putting you in boxes and labeling you and sticking it on you so we can talk about you. But you guys are part of something called Generation Boomerang. You're the boomerang generation. Does anyone know what that is? Can I integrate it into this? Do they know who you are? Yeah. Isn't it the generation that's like, uh, they're like stuck or going on their own? Their parents are like taking care of themselves? Yeah, that's more or less exactly what it is. So... I'm not sure if any of you plan on being boomerangs. In fact, no one really plans on it. That's kind of the whole point of the concept. So if you become a boomerang, here's what you do. Step one, you leave the house. And I don't just mean like temporarily, like, like you, you come to classes, but you still live at home. So no, that's not what it means. If you're a boomerang, you've officially moved out of the house. You've gone off on your own for whatever reason. Somehow, something happened, and you end up coming back and you end up living back with your parents, and they're more or less taking care of you again. That's what you guys are. And, and any guesses what percentage of you guys? Just globally, if we take all the people like between 18 and about 25, yeah. Well, I do know there's one percentage that's like 18 to 25, so our generation owns like only like 7% of the wealth. And that's part okay. of the problem. Okay. How is that part of it? Well, wouldn't that be good for you guys? No, because it's like such a small percentage. Oh, because it's a small percentage. Yeah. So how many of you, if I, if I was a betting man, let's see, there's one, two, three, four, five, I can't count. There's only of you in here who think this would be easy. How many of you, if I was, I was going to bet in Vegas on a number, how many of you are going to be boomerangs? What would you guess out of eight of you? Four. Not, whoa, holy cow. <laughs> no, it's not that. About three. About 30, 35 percent of the people in your generation end up becoming boomerangs. You, you try to go out, but you something happens, and you end up coming back. And that's what that video is all about. Um, and then the discussion question, which is up there, of course, kind of integrates that into just your perspective. I'm just curious what you think after you watch that, um, if you can relate to any of the people in the story. Maybe you can. Maybe you'll watch it and be like, oh, my God, that's me six years down the road. And maybe you don't want that to happen. Maybe you don't care. Um, but, yeah, so the checklist is pretty simple. Um, we are in chapter one, so we're officially using the textbook this week. Um, come to your live session. Congratulations. Um, and the two watchables online related to the discussion question. So there we go. I think everyone actually answered the discussion question, so congratulations. Um, it's pretty easy grading-wise on that. Uh, but just, again, keep in mind that that's meant to be the writing of the course. 
Uh, a good barometer, I mean, I, I guess I'm, if I was in your shoes, how would I go about writing the discussion questions wondering like, huh, like if I want to get all the points and all that sort of thing, just take a quick look at the other answer, right? And if you, so if you look at a few answers and they're like this long, and then you look at your answer and it's like that long, maybe you should write some more letters to make it a little bit. So does that make sense? Just keep that in mind. But if you have any questions as you go, just ask me. All right, so chapter one, at least what we're doing from chapter one, kind of has to do with this idea of just the simple meaning of age. And so we're just going to talk about some basic principles about the field of adulthood and aging, getting a little bit more specific on the groundwork. But the first thing I need to in your notes, I'd like you to do, I just have a couple questions for you, actually six questions for you. First one, so just... Just give it a guess in your notes. So write down the concept and then your guess after that. So as we get older, and by when I say getting older, I mean starting now. So you're about 20-ish or so. Think of your life course up to about age, let's just pick an arbitrary older number, 88. So from here to 88, what happens to your overall happiness and life satisfaction? Now, I guess this could be a personal question, because I don't know how happy you are now. <laughs> Maybe you're miserable, so like, well, it can't get any worse. Think, think in more general terms, in regard just humanity in general. In other words, what I'm asking you is, from your young adulthood to very old adulthood, what's the general pattern we see in individuals' happiness and life satisfaction? Maybe it's a straight line. Maybe it goes up. Maybe it goes down. Maybe it peaks and valleys. The choice is yours. So really just the first thing that comes to your head. You don't need to spend too much time philosophizing about this because we're going to revisit all these options. The second, your cognitive ability. So we kind of defined this last week. Your thinking. Someone needs to invent like a mask with a straw. So I can just drink my coffee like so I can walk around like normal. That would be nice. Let me describe what I mean by this. Frailty. What I mean by frailty is your overall physical well-being. I guess I'm thinking of this maybe from an athletic point of view, although you don't need to be an athlete to answer this question. What happens to your muscle tone, your bones? You become Mr. Glass when you're 70 years old. The next one. Anyone, what does what is this refer to? Your parents might be there. Yeah. It's like when your kids leave. Yeah, so when your kids leave, 15F syndrome is the idea that when your kids leave the house, you become a little less satisfied with your relationship with your partner. That's called empty nest syndrome. So the kids leave the house, and the, the quality of the marriage or the relationship inside the house that has nothing to do with the kids declines. There's, was that number four? I'm not counting it myself as we go. Number five, brain change. What I mean by this, as you get older, your brain loses the ability to adapt and change. What do you think? What happens to your brain's ability to adapt and change as we get older? And then last but not least, I believe this is number six. What happens to your social world as you get older? I guess in general what I'm asking, as you go from your 20s to your 80s, you become more social, less social, maybe it doesn't change at all. Thank you. 
All right. Well, now, now let's go back. Number one, what did you guys put? What happens to our overall happiness and life satisfaction? As someone in the humor field, you don't know what that is, we'll talk to you later. Uh, this is something that's been studied quite a bit. Lots of research studies on this. The overall happiness and life satisfaction. What do you guys say? Is that happiness defined for life satisfaction? That's an interesting answer. You've got to pick them apart a little bit. Anybody else? Anything different? Speak through our mask. You thought it declined? A very popular myth. So it's okay if you said that. So actually, it's, it's the opposite. So Dante, you're half right. Uh, with regards to your, so happiness is an emotion, right? And life satisfaction is not necessarily emotion. It's a state of being. Both of these increase as you get older. You don't even write this next part down, but it's important to note that we all have anecdotal evidence of someone that we know that got older and is now miserable. That, of course, that's true. But I want you to think about that first, because it turns out that's not normal. In general, the older we get, the happier we get, and our life satisfaction actually increases. So if you're happy now and happy with your life and satisfied, great. It's only going to get better. And if you're not, great. It's probably only going to get better. I guess that's the message. Oh, what's the next one? I'm going the wrong direction. There we go. Our cognitive ability. Where am I? Oh. Hi, Becky. What do you think? I said they decline. Do you think they decline? Anybody else? I have this miserable view of aging. Yes. I said they're probably like a peak, like mid age, to be random fancy and things that you like. Job and stuff, but then I, <laughs> I love it. So the peak is when we get a job. Damn it, I've been declining for a decade. It explains actually six or seven things. No, it's a good answer. So you're, thinking it, you're giving it some thought. Yeah. I said it's like relative. Uh, what do you mean by that? It's like your brain's like a muscle. Like if you stop working it, like some older people I know that are really excited. Yes. They keep like reading and like doing college classes and keep like working and yep. like just like. And I so wish we had. I think I told you guys last. Usually in this class, I have like three or four people from Copal Noakes coming in. And it's always been fun. And they, they love this part. They, they always love this first part because they're like, oh, my God. Then they look at you guys like, how dare you think of us this way? This is actually a big myth of aging. Overall, cognitive abilities either stay the same or actually improve. What? We never talk about that. Improve? What the hell? Nothing gets better. Actually, it does. The older you get, we're going to get a little more specific. And we'll zoom in on this. There's actually a whole chapter dedicated to this. And again... I'd like to put this in the same category with happiness, life satisfaction. Of course, we all know someone, multiple people maybe, who are older. And I don't mean someone who's like suffered from dementia and, and near death, right? Of course, their cognitive abilities have declined. But overall, our, it, our cognitive abilities in math, our verbal skills, and even certain parts of our memory actually improve as we get older. All things you would think just fall off the window. So we actually see either stability or of improvements. And what the reason I said let's go back to happiness is think of that person that you know who might be older, like in their 70s, with significant cognitive decline, tells you something. And that's actually not normal. Because in general, most people don't experience that. So that's the good news. I guess we're taking our first steps down the path of hey, maybe aging isn't that bad. Frailty. What do you think? Maybe you're seeing a pattern, the answer to these questions. Frailty, what do you think? Actually, let me zoom ahead of my PowerPoint a little bit. Probably all depends on maybe some of your experiences, but oh, we're really cheating here. How old do you think that guy is? 75. He's 76 years old. <laughs> I think he can kick my ass. <laughs> this idea that when we get older, we become frail. And I, I think you'll understand this answer better in about 40 minutes. 
but before you leave here. To be honest, and now again, we're talking about absence of disease, right? I'm not talking about, of course, things can happen to you that are going to get in the way. But overall, whether or not you become frail when you're in your 70s or 80s is a choice. You can choose to stop doing things and choose to become frail, or you can choose not to. You can keep going. Spoiler alert. It actually has a lot to do with what you're doing right now. We often don't think of what we're doing in our 20s as being connected to when we're 80, but it's huge, actually. That's another theme of this class is I think people realize, like, oh, the choices I'm making right now in my 20s really are going to either pay off or get cashed in uh, when you're 60, 70, and 80 years old. Again, is everyone going to be free of disease? Of course not. But keep that in mind. I think I want to retire. What's that? I feel like I would want to retire from doing this. You want to retire from doing this. doesn't mean you always have to be like, right? Super. Oh, and in fact, there's actually some study that say that's actually not. I've actually, you do need to slow that down. Right. It's just moderate stuff, right? And so we're not talking about you need to be like an Olympic athlete. But moderate, even, you know, like weight training, even for older people is like huge. But it's just weight. So we get to the, the, the research on how quickly old people can go from being frail and, oh, to, oh. Wait a second, I feel like I'm 40 again. So it's actually pretty amazing stuff that you can do. MPS syndrome. What do you think? When the kids leave, yeah. It seems like I'm from you. Oh, oh yeah. So when trust me, and maybe you've seen this in your own parents, you realize when you go home, there's some paint changes on your walls, like they've already started redecorating, like they're spending some time in Florida. Like, what wait, what's happening? No, actually, yes, when Overall, when children leave the house, parents actually become happier. We just talked about this in my marriage and family therapy class, the impact of having kids. No offense, guys, but we're already making some plans. We have 13 and 19 year olds. We're like, oh my gosh, five years and Kyle's out of the house. I mean, that is sad. Of course, it's like, holy crap, what the hell happened? We're in a time machine. Think of the possibilities. Go out again. Not that. But empty nest syndrome overall. Now, again, does that I actually see a lot of couples in therapy who are experiencing this. This is a real thing. So empty nest syndrome isn't a myth. What's the myth though is that it's normal. So are there couples that fall apart when their kids leave the house? Yes. In fact, divorce rates are high when children leave the house. Because sometimes the kids are the only thing holding that relationship together. But in general and overall, it's not a normal thing. It's the, the normal pattern is Improvements in the relationship. And then last but not least. Sorry, no, this isn't last, is it? Or is it? No more. No. <laughs> I'm 43. Can your brain still change or does the doors close? I actually want to write down a word that will come back to you many times. The word I want you to write down is neuro like in neuroscience, and plasticity, neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the concept that defines how our brain changes. Of course, when you're young, you get exposed to things. You may not know this. I guess it depends on what classes you had in sight. But your brain isn't something that just like matures and is like some kind of static organ. Like it's everything that you do in your life changes your brain slightly. The question is, as we get older, does the door shut or are we still capable of changing our brain? What do you think, Dante? How do we, this is like number five. You can probably guess the answer. Uh, I said it's, uh, it doesn't decline, it just kind of stays the same. And, I can, and it can, it can actually improve. So it either stays the same or it can improve. Just a little nugget for the future. Again, something to get you excited if you come to class. We used to think, in fact, 15 years ago, we used to think that your brain can't produce any new neurons when you're an adult. That was the, the idea was we have some growth spurts when we're younger. And, but then when we get to about age 25 or so, you've probably got all the neurons you're ever going to have, and it's like this use it or lose it type deal. Now we know that even when you're 75 years old, you can actually produce new neurons inside your brain 
and parts of your brain can actually change, just like you can when you're 25. Now, does it happen as quickly? Well, we'll see. That's a little teaser for the end. So the brain can still change. So neuroplasticity is still a thing when you're old. And then last, oh, this is what I say for last. And again, I'm not talking about you, because I don't know how social you are right now. But in general, as we get older, do we become more social or less social? Absolutely. We actually become much more social. In fact, there's this weird, if you want to know the pattern, when we're young, well, we're almost forced to be social, right? Because we go to school and we're around 800 people every single day. When we're young, we're, we're typically usually a lot social. But then when we get into middle adulthood, that's, it declines a lot. But what are you doing? Well, you're going to work every day, and your, your social sphere is probably limited. But then once we retire, our social network typically increases dramatically. And I guess this is one aspect where I can relate to. I think of, I think of my wife's grandparents. Oh, my God. Like they're, always, they're always with friends. They're, they're always doing something. So, yeah, overall, our sociality and our social connections actually increase over time. So all that, I was going to start with this slide, but that would have given it away. So we just started with six myths of aging. Your, your book, actually, I did all these assuming that no one reads the book. Because if you did read the book, this is literally like page number one of chapter one. In fact, it has ten of them. I think I added a couple that weren't on there, but... But there's a lot. And I guess the takeaway from this is there's a lot of misconceptions and myths about aging. Are there things that can be bad? Of course. But there's also things that can be bad about being 25. Um, overall, getting old isn't as bad as people probably think it is. I guess that's the message. So six myths and then these two truisms. What the heck am I talking about? We kind of touched on these last time, but now we're going to get more specific. Is in regard to the, the video that you watched, which was kind of a mixed bag on purpose, right? You saw it's kind of the good, but then some of you even typed out, like, now I'm scared. <laughs> I wasn't scared last week, now I am. But now that we've talked about these myths, you can see how a lot of times when people find themselves in predicaments, it's, it's disease. It's things that we can hopefully treat and stop. But... So two truisms of aging. Again, I know we talked about these last, now we're going to get a little more specific. The first truism anyone remember what it is? I don't think I had you write it down, but we did say it. Just in terms of aging in general, what's one thing, and by truism, I just mean something that's fundamentally true. I don't know what else to call it. Any ideas? I'm just doing this. I don't get popped up. The first truism that as a society, we are older now than we ever have been. We are living, I guess another way to say that, we are living a lot longer today, in general, than we ever have before. How many of you, I just have sheer curiosity, I didn't write this question down. How many of you know or did know your great grandparents? Not, not, even, not even close. They don't even have a name. They were long gone. I think we mentioned this. Do you remember what? And I know we're going in the way back machine here, but 1920, if you think of my great grandparents, that's probably when they were, well, they were probably born before them. What was our average lifespan? Do you remember? I know I threw it out there. 49. In the 1920s, the average adult, can you imagine? You're halfway done. Congrats. Are, you, are you nearing retirement yet? You're 25. You're in your ripe old, old age, right? 49. Isn't that crazy? 40 freaking nine was the average lifespan. In the United States. Is the age perfect? Look wise? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Like, I was thinking of it like you're like, like yeah. sure, you die, you're like, like a, a sci-fi movie. Like you're born, like, hey mom, I'm four now. <laughs> Screw kindergarten. <laughs> you're just ready to go. Well, no, actually, what well, was well, why? No, not at all. We didn't age age quicker. Well, the answer is actually in one of the reasons. So, so it's, why? How, why? What, how do you explain this? Why are we living so long? Well, one, and why, why as a society are we older, and why are we living longer? Well, the answer to living longer is, is pretty straightforward. It's a simple medical technology. We 
we talk about vaccines, I know people have some ridiculously idiotic ideas about vaccines, but you get a vaccine like the MMR shot, you give that to your kid, you take it for granted, all oh, the measles, mumps, and rubella, like measles, whatever. Measles will kill you. It's a deadly disease. It's not just, oh, you get red spots. Mumps will kill you. Rubella will kill you. Polio will kill you. All these things we've developed over the years is exactly what's made our society live longer. It's why people don't drop dead when they're... So think about it. 49, that was just the average. What that meant was you still had people living into their 70s. Of course you did. The problem is you had a lot of people dropping dead in their 20s. Young 20s. 18, 17. In fact, if you do talk to an older, older person in one of your interviews, there was a trend. This is, I remember my grandma telling me this, that I really had to, like, holy cow, because my, my dad has a lot of brothers and sisters. And I remember a conversation with my grandma once when she was still alive, and we talked about the trend of how people used to have, like, really large families. And this is true. Like, the, the norm today is, like, one or two kids, like, tops. That's, like, the norm, like, most couples want. If you go back 50 years, people would have seven, eight, like, right, these huge families. And the reason was actually very practical. It wasn't necessarily that they wanted these large families, but you knew if you had 10 kids, five of them are going to make it past the age of 12, and five of them won't. That's why people had such large families. And then some people got stuck with eight or nine kids because half of them didn't drop dead from some kind of weird disease we didn't have a vaccine for. So we're living a lot longer, mainly based off of our medical technology. Why are we older as a society? So that's the first thing to write down. We're, we're older as a society. We're living longer. The reason we're living longer is pretty much technology and medicine. But the reason we're older as a society in general, two words, and you've probably heard this before, the baby boom. What is... You've heard, I, I hope you've heard this term before, right? This is actually the first time we labeled a generation. I called you guys the boomerang generation. The, the big, one of the first labels we gave was the baby boom generation. What, what is this? And, and how is it impacting us? Yeah. Was it from post World War II? It's exactly what it is. My dad is actually part of the baby boom generation. Post were just after World War II, our country experienced. A baby boom, like no other, still hasn't been replicated. And it's been like a wave of people, this big wave tsunami of people, a population boom, that's been slowly moving through our society. And now the baby boom generation is about, they're, either, well, they're 65 and up. So if, there's, if you know someone in their 50s, they're not baby boomers. But 65 and up, most of them are in their 70s now. But so we have this huge spike of old people in our society based off of that. And they're they're moving through. So that's why as a society we have this big, big spike. So that's the first truism. We're older as a society and we're living longer. And you've got the reasons. The second truism is that because of that, we are faced with two new harsh realities. They're really kind of questions, I guess, more than reality. The first question is, and this, the, the documentary you watched last week tried to emphasize this. The first is, are we prepared? You can write this down if you want to, it'll come up later. A new phenomenon for, for my generation, you're the boomerang generation. A lot of people that are my age are now part of what's called the sandwich. And I love these names. They're so silly. The sandwich generation. You, you're shaking your head. What is what is this? Exactly. There's a lot of people my age. I'm not one of them. But there's a lot of people my age who are taking care of their own kids in their home and also the older person in their home. But And I don't just mean fun grandma lives with you and goes off to Vegas once a week. No, this means there's an older person living in your home who needs care, who needs taken care of. So you're being stretched at both ends. You're taking care of this generation, and you're taking care of this generation. And a lot of it has to do with that question of, are we prepared? Because for a lot of people, the answer is no. There's no place to put 
grandma. There's no place to take grandma. Because if you didn't know, it's expensive. And insurance probably isn't going to cover anything. Unfortunately, one of my grandparents suffered from Alzheimer's disease. And as it was getting bad, well, you have a choice to make. You can try to find a facility, right, to put your, your person in. I think, I think the cheapest one my mom found for my grandma was roughly $45,000 a year. That's how expensive, and it, this is out of pocket. There, there is no such thing as insurance unless you're a senator and have like that kind of insurance. Um, but for the normal person, there is no such thing as insurance that's going to pay for a facility like that. It just doesn't exist. You either can pay for it or you don't. So my, my mom has one brother, so they took turns. My mom would have her for about two weeks, and then the brother would have her for about two weeks. So they go back and forth and back and forth. And, and we'll talk about that reality when we get into the dementia chapters and Alzheimer's. But it was only really towards the end, 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 when it was getting, like, impossible like, to, to provide the care where they finally had to make the choice. But so that's the point. Are we prepared? We, we have this big wave of people who are going to be encountering things like this. And we don't really have, we, we've never been a country that's had, we have nursing homes, of course we do. We have places like Copeland Oaks, of course we do. But we don't really have, put it this way, the infrastructure to deal with the boom that's coming. So what's happening is a lot of people are being stuck, I guess, when we look at it that way, not knowing what to do. So that's the first question is, are we prepared? The second question, and then we'll move on. And this might sound like a strange question to ask now, We'll circle back to this in week 16. So this is like a, we're saving this for the end. When is it okay to die? And I guess to add on to that, who says when it's okay? One thing that documentary emphasized, the Living Old documentary, was we can keep people alive for a really long time. But when is it okay to say, maybe death is better? Maybe death is okay, and who makes that call? And all the fun, ethical, legal, philosophical questions that come along with answering that question. That was just one part all right, so moving ahead. There are four big principles of aging. It doesn't look like four, but the, the four are the ones that are in, in caps. I'm going to pause at this PowerPoint slide, too. Again, chapter one is all about some basic concepts. Put it this way, like building a glossary of terms in your head and ideas and concepts that will lay the groundwork for the next 14 weeks. I think we have a semester or something like that. So the first principle is the continuity principle of aging and getting older. And again, all the stuff that's going to come out of my mouth isn't necessarily on the slide. You need me to slow down or repeat something. So the continuity principle, what goes underneath that? Well, the first thing to write down under that is something I emphasized about 10 minutes ago. The first part of this is what you do right now matters. The choices you're making right now matter. Are you in shape right now? Well, that matters. If you exercise now, do you have, and I don't mean like being like, again, I'm not saying when I say exercise, I don't mean I'm going to sound like a health fan. I don't mean being an elite athlete. I just mean, do you take care of yourself? How well do you take care of yourself? Or are you just letting things completely slide? Because it matters. Because the people, or one of these principles you can see is called the survivor principle. It turns out what you're doing in your 20s and your 30s, again, it's the best way I can, I can put it. It's either going to really pay off the older you get, or it's really going to be paying some dividends later. In other words, you're going to be paying for these choices when you're 40s and in your 50s and in your 60s, because there's a correlation between how you are now and how you're going to be later on. There's, there's another part of this too, though, the continuity principle. So what you do now is going to pay off 
The second part of this has to do with your identity. As you get older, so as you go into your 50s and your 60s, and this is cliche, you hear people say this all the time, you are going to be the same person. Yes, you're going to develop, and we're going to talk about the ways that we change. Of course, you're going to change a little bit. But by and large, it's a weird way to think about you. You are your brain, right? I mean, you're in there somewhere. Where are you? But you're going to be the same person when you're 50 that you were when you were 40. Your identity is not going to change. Your body and the people around you are, of course, they're going to change. But you're going to be the same person. But, there's a but. One more thing to add under this. And these are kind of unfortunate, but there's something to think about. How many of you have worked a lot with older people like in, in your life? A little bit? I don't know. Yeah, cool. yeah. Just saying, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Here's, so there's two things that are unfortunate about this. The first one is when you when you are older, people are going to judge you. So when you're 70 and you meet someone who's in their 20s or 30s, they are going to judge you. Because when they see you, when they meet you for the first time, they're not going to think of you. And this is a weird thing to think about when you're 20, I get it. But when they see you for the first time, they're not going to think of Callista as the 20-year-old runner from Mount Union. They're going to see Callista the seven-year-old older person. In your head, you're still 20-year-old Callista. Does that make sense? You're still that same person. But we judge older people. We don't see them as their younger selves. We just see them as their older selves. And all those myths and misconceptions and ideas and stereotypes we have about older people will get shoved onto how we treat that person and how we interact with that person. So I guess we could distill... I guess the but down to one thing, is it's all about judgment. We judge other people, and people are going to judge us. And it all comes down to, we just we just don't see. You ever, you ever look at old pictures with your grandparents when they were younger, and you're like, wow, grandpa was cute. I remember something really strange happened once. This is like, it's like 20 years ago. It was at my grandma's house. We were going through some old stuff. And she pulled out this old black and white picture. And I, I swear to God, I saw myself in the picture. And I'm like, who in the hell is that? And she's like, that's like, it was like some cousin, like some cousin of an uncle, but it looked, and everyone in the room was like, oh, like you've been replicated. Like it looked just like me. And it really freaked me out. Like it was like that. And suddenly I thought of myself as being like in 1892, sitting there with one of the old cameras, like, like it literally freaking looked just like me. Like it was insane. But when we see older people, isn't this true? We don't really think of them as being 20 and 30. We just see them as being their 70-year-old selves. But in their head, they still feel like they did when they're you. So just keep that in mind. You're, you're going to be that person someday. And the people that really grasp this, and I think people that work really well with older people have this in mind all the time. They don't, right? They just, they know they're, they're just people who were once 20. I was once like you. Because they don't need to move ahead. So the continuity principle. Identity. And the fact that what you're doing now is going, it matters. What you're doing now matters. The second principle is individuality. As we get older, into our 80s and 90s, do we become more alike or more different? Sometimes our old, people, are older, older people all the same? <laughs> Absolutely not. So as you get older, this is another myth. This is actually, I think, on the first page of your book. As you get older, we actually become more different and differentiated from each other. In fact, the funny thing is, you guys are more like now than you will be when you're 80. I know there's some little differences, but for the most part, you all dress the same, go through the same routines, eat the same basic kind of foods. I know we're not eating because we have to. But as we get older, we actually become more differentiated. We become more individualized. And there's two terms. And they're up there. I actually wrote these ones down for you. 
the two ways that we see this in display, the first is what we call inter-individuality. And inter-individuality inter means we become more different than the people around us. That one makes sense. You went down this path, your best friend from high school went down this path, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So inter-individuality, we become more different than our peers. But the second concept has to do with just you as a person, intra-individuality. What the heck does that mean? Well, that means that different parts of your body are going to be impacted by aging in different ways. Does that make sense? The so different parts of your body are going to be impacted by the aging process in different ways. Some of that's just going to have to do with simple biology, your genes. Some people my age still have a full head of hair. I don't. Inter-individuality. Legs are still working good and still run, but the hairline impacted greatly. Silly example of inter-individuality. The second one, or the third one, excuse me, the third principle, normal aging. We actually divide up aging into three different categories. With the overall message being, disease is not normal. So what are the three different parts, three different aging processes that people go through. The first one is called primary aging. Primary aging is something, is, it's universal. It's the changes that are going to happen to all of them. Well, they happen at different rates at different times, of course, but by and large, there are some things we can, all of us in this room, are not going to escape. All of us will have hair that loses its color. I'll actually talk about what's actually going on there. Might be smart. All of us will have skin that becomes less elastic. Isn't this fun? No, it, it, so there's that's primary aging. There's some things you cannot you cannot stop. You can buy every product that you want, but it's it's inevitable. The futile battle. That's normal aging, though. Stuff that happens to everyone. Then there's secondary aging. Secondary aging is disease. Things that we would not call normal aging, that, but that could happen to you. Dementia, for example, secondary aging is not a normal part of the aging process. And then finally, something that's not really fun to think about, but that does happen is something that we call tertiary aging. Anyone know what this is? Tertiary aging, maybe some of you have seen it of you have not. Tertiary aging is something that happens at the very end of life. It's a very rapid process. And at the very end of life, and I guess I'm assuming, and I don't mean just anyone who passes away at any age. Someone who passes away at a very old, at a very old age. At the very end, there's a very rapid loss of functioning that happens. And maybe you've experienced this. Well, we're going to talk, if you didn't know, we are going to talk about the dying process of death in this class. Like, that's another thing we never talk about in our society, right? We, we like, hide it. Like it's, it's like a mystery. But if you've ever known someone who's older who's passed away, it's, it's a very common thing for people to say is, I just saw her last week. What? What do you mean? I remember, this has just happened two months ago. A professor from here, he lives in Louisville. I just saw him in Giant Eagle, like literally eight days before he passed away. And I talked to his wife, like, yeah, it happened quick. Like he was, last week on Wednesday, he was fine. He didn't really feel good on Thursday, and by Sunday, he was gone. That's called tertiary aging. And you go from, hey, I'm, I'm functioning, <laughs> everything's going fine, and there's a rapid loss of functioning at the end of life, and that's called tertiary aging. And it can happen within days. Someone can go from speaking and communicating and verbal and physical to are just, they're just not there. And then finally, that we have time for this, the survivors. The survivor principle of aging. Hmm. 
The survivor principle of aging has a very straightforward practical definition. Only those individuals who outmaneuver and outlive the threats of aging will be lucky enough to live a really long life. Uh, you're a survivor. Are you going to be a survivor or not? And, and the answer to that question, if you're thinking about yourself, am I going to live to be 103? Are you going to be a survivor? The answer lies within the biopsychosocial approach to aging. The answer to that question is, some of it's up to you, a lot of it's up to you, actually. But of course, there's some things you can't control. You can't control your genetics. So the biopsychosocial approach, so think of your biology, think of your, again, even in, we could break this down even more. Some of the biology you can control, but some genetics you have, you have no control over. Do you have good genes or bad genes? Let's just keep this practical, the bio approach. Good genes or bad genes? Some people have people in their family tree who consistently live to their 90s. That's an indicator that you have good genes for aging in your body, in your family tree. The psychological aspect of this, how, again, something that we don't talk a lot about in our society, unfortunately, how mentally healthy are you? How well do you take care of your mental health? And what are some Natural tools that you have. Are, are you, do you have natural intelligence? Well, you're here in college, so I'm going to say yes. Congratulations. And then social. What's your social network like? Do you have one? How well do you keep care of these things? I always see these things as like, I even did this in my lecture notes, the biopsychosocial. Think of all of these on a scale of 1 to 10. Where would you put yourself at? And the survivors are the ones that have really high scores in all of these, starting now in the 20s and 30s and 40s, and they keep this up. And these are all interconnected. And you don't need to write this example down, but just think of how this, they're all interconnected with each other. Let's say you're just really intelligent, intelligent enough to come to college. Well, it turns out a college education is related to living longer. Well, why is that? Well, because people that go to college typically get better jobs. They have things like healthcare, resources, money, which all tie into living longer lives. Again, these things, you can't separate them. They're all connected. But those are our four basic principles. I've been talking long enough. Let's. Let's meet one of the survivors and see if we can glean some, some knowledge from him. Well, I run out of pieces of God 50 and a half, but. Of course, there's a commercial, so you can't see what he's saying. Well, I don't know why. I think too. He told me first. But I don't know why he kept it. I think too. He told me. Now he told me. My name is Richard Harvey Old. I am a hundred and nine years old. Still walk, still talk, and I still drive. I just got my last review this year. They give you an idea. They have a thing they're giving me our passing. I feel good at going on drugs. I like to drive myself on road drive. They drive crazy. I am the oldest road to get. 
Ellen Allen in 1940. Major Mo Braver, drama. I can think of every double book, you know, without a lock on it. Ain't scared. Oh, you never know about it. Yeah. She see a soldier with a gun, you don't see him turn around and go back this way. He may go sideways. He ain't gonna turn around and go back. Okay, I can put his ears, he ain't gonna go back. So yeah, when you go in there, you just say, well, God is like you now. See? He's gonna take care of you. If it's your time to go, the bullet's gonna get you. If it ain't your time to go, that bullet going over your head. It ain't gonna hit you. So man will kill you, but God is gonna keep you alive. I helped those cats and they keep me happy. <laughs> 
I I tell the truth, they keep me happy. I want to see my cats every morning. I wake up one o'clock, or either wake up at two or three. Every time I wake up, I just get up. I'm getting me a cup of coffee sometimes. I think I woke up to coffee in the morning. This morning I drink about that much whiskey. I love milk, fish, corn, and soup. I love soup. A lot of people don't like soup. They don't drink milk. But I've been drinking milk for all, right, all my life. And ice cream, I eat ice cream every night. It makes me happy. Hey, but butter for corn. If you buy one buy it, you buy butter for corn. <laughs> and the old can die. Does anybody die that want to eat? Church is a wonderful place. Love the place. Keeps me going. Makes me feel good. I think that has to be pushing myself along. Going to church. You learn something in church too. No, no, I'm real better. I treat people. You know, I'm all in this. I say something to somebody else. You know? <laughs> and singing, I love that church singing. Beautiful. Church is just for everybody. But you gotta go for one person, that's yourself. Good to have a spiritual life, but you gotta live it. Make, it makes you feel better to have a question around your life instead of you get all real nice. Oh, well, he's 91 years old. And I'm, I'm, I'm 109. She looks good. Yeah, That's you nice. go to the hard see people. You go to the grocery store. You go shopping sometime. And I think it's just crazy. And I think of different places. She's just a nice person. We have fun together. I've seen lots and lots of living. I'm still living good. Ain't suffering nothing. I guess what I want. So, I'm still living all right. But give up, you're through. You, you, you bad yourself. I am. I'm giving you some of my secret to a love life. If you ever use it, you don't use it, that's your bad luck. Mm -hmm. I can't even got here yet. And I don't know when I'm coming here. I don't know where I'm going. You eat. Neither one of them know where we're going. I may give out, but I never give up.